Hey Swifties, welcome to a brand new episode of Swifty School, where together we walk down Ilya Street covering the latest news and Easter eggs from our fearless leader, Taylor Swift. I'm your host, Reagan Bailey, and it is enchanting to have you here. Now that we're out of the woods, let's get into today's episode. It's another great day to be alive at the same time as Taylor Swift. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another very special guest episode. Now, before we talk all about our guests today, I want to give you guys some brief updates because the Swiftivities have been off the charts. You guys know we have been clowning hard for February. We have been waiting for this moment. The black nail has finally arrived in the coffee cup. If you know, you know. So let's get a brief overview of everything that we're going to be talking about today. If you haven't already joined, make sure you guys check out my newest Patreon. If you're like, Reagan, what's Patreon? I just launched a new membership program where you guys are able to join and get even more Swiftivities. We've got three different tiers starting at $2 up to $10 and the senior class is going crazy right now. I'm calling it the class of 2024 and make sure you stick to the end to hear some of the newest members and head to patreon.com slash 50 school if you guys are interested in joining. But without further ado, let's get into today's episode. You guys asked for more guests and ask and you shall receive. Today, I am so excited to announce a guest that is also here in LA. We connected recently. His name is K-Tone Roberts. You guys might be familiar with him because of a little app called TikTok which we will get into in a minute, but he is an LA-based human resources professional by day, self-proclaimed pop culture enthusiast extraordinaire by night and on the socials. He has a following of around 50,000 followers over on TikTok and his favorite era is reputation. K-Tone, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. This is my first podcast interview ever. So, wow. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to have you. I know everybody's been asking for podcast guests, especially men. For some reason, everyone's like, let's switch up the vibes. Let's change it up. So I'm so excited, especially that we have someone whose favorite era is Reputation because Reputation is one of my least favorite eras. (laughs) So I feel like we can definitely dive into that. I know. But we can definitely dive into that because I'm curious to know your thoughts for sure. But I feel like one thing you do really well is you speak what everyone else is thinking and your commentary on pop culture on social media is not only like so witty, but I feel like it's a stream of consciousness. So can you tell everyone a little bit more about the content that you share over on socials? Because I feel like they're going to appreciate it. Yeah, well, I will say my Taylor content was definitely my largest explosion on TikTok. But before Taylor, I was way more focused on award shows, the Met Gala, movies, television. I really like to dive deep into works of art. And that's why I dive deep into music as well. So exploring Taylor for the first time on TikTok has been a real experience because I've talked about so many different celebrities on my TikTok account before. And this is the first time where an audience this large has like engaged with me and helped me along the journey. And that's not something I typically get with different fandoms. Like, I don't really get a lot of fans who come in and pull me along the way, give me new interests, drop ideas into my DM. So it's been really exciting to experience that with a group of people. I love that. That's such an interesting point. And I definitely want to touch on sort of the Swifty experience. I like your point of like people have been helping you along. I feel like that is definitely one of the key distinguishing factors of like the Swiftdom itself, not only in sheer size, like it's gigantic and there's a million people who are Swifties now, but the fact that everybody, it feels like a sisterhood, a brotherhood, like everybody's in it to win it, wants to help each other out. But I want to take a little bit further back to October when we first met. Now, if you listen to episode 25 of the podcast, I had Kayla on the episode and Kayla was hosting a Halloween party. Now I was at the party. I went by myself. I was excited to meet new people, but I was in the corner and Kato walked in and I immediately turned to everybody. I was like, oh my God, I follow that guy on TikTok. And they're like, you know, Kato. And I was like, yeah. And I was like, you know, Kato. And they're like, I was like, do you guys follow him? I thought they invited you because they followed you, but they're like, no, he's our real life friend. So I was so excited to meet you because I had just seen you like the day or two before blow up because of your Taylor video and then running into you was hilarious. So we've since connected a couple of times. We were like, we have to do a podcast episode together, but I want your perspective because at the same time we were meeting was around the time you were going crazy viral. So walk us through, I wrote down your viral video was on 1030. So the day before Halloween, what was that video like? And walk us through that moment. I will say the thing that's about TikTok that's 
insane is that it's always the videos that you least expect to do anything that go the biggest. Always. I was just laying in my bed when that video went viral. And I, I was just talking. I was just talking into the camera. But the whole yeah. reason that I even started to listen to that album, I was listening to Slut, was because it was after it was after like another friends gathering. There was like a lot of people who like kept talking about 1989. They kept talking about it, kept talking about it. And I said, okay, you know what? I'll finally listen. I'll finally dive deep into Taylor Swift and then Slut play. And Slut for me, I was shocked when I was listening to it because in my yeah. brain, Taylor Swift would never create anything like this. And then right. I was like, I became fast, really, really fast. So when I was talking in the camera, I just kind of said something along the lines of there's always one of those songs that almost feels like crack cocaine that makes you go and listen to someone's entire discography again. People ate it up. And then next thing you know, I was just diving deeper and deeper into her music. I wrote down this video has like, I think almost 4 million views. Over 468,000 people liked it. It was saved and shared like nearly 20,000 times. I know this video for sure came up immediately on my For You page. And I think what's so fun about seeing people embrace Taylor Swift, especially like later in her career, is that so many of us have been along this journey forever. So to see someone do it like so late in the stage and get so excited about it is just really fun to see. I was so curious to know because Slut was really disappointing to Swifties. So it's funny that that was the song that pulled you in because me personally, I was not excited about Slut because we wanted something that was like raunchy and like almost, I don't want to say exploitative, but like maybe more storytelling. And it was more of a soft, pretty song. So like, was there anything specific that you can recall that pulled you in about Slut? Yeah, yeah. I felt like what she was talking about, and I, I want to say this as respectfully as possible, was actually one of the reasons that I never got deep into her music. I felt as if all of the media that I was absorbing about Taylor Swift and only hearing about her relationships, it almost made me do the opposite of what it was doing for her fan base. Like, the more and more you hear about her in the media, it almost yeah. made her fan base go and listen to her more. But it pulled me away. It made me like, I was like, well, what do I have to go and listen to her music for? I can right. see it all in the blogs. I can see it page six. So it stopped me from really diving deeper into her albums because at the time I felt like it wasn't something that I could relate to. Then I heard Slut and I was like, oh, like, wait a minute. Like, I guess I, I didn't realize that she was experiencing it to this level. And I was like, wait, what's going on in these albums that made someone write this? You know, like I, yeah. I really wanted to experience it. And I will say, as someone who's like a big Beyonce fan as well, I didn't even put this two and two together. Like after it was going viral, someone was like, well, I know you, I know you're in the hive. I, I know you hear the the drunken love line. And it was like, oh my God. Like it was almost like brainwashed. <laughs> so funny. Well, I feel like we forgot about one of the most important parts was that come October 31st, Taylor liked the video. That was, okay, so here's the thing about that that's so weird. Her likes being on is such an insane amplifier because oh, yeah. people were commenting in the video, Taylor liked, Taylor liked, Taylor liked. I was like, how do they know she liked it? Because most yes. people don't have their likes public, you know? No. So then I go and I look at it and I was like, oh my goodness, like I'm there. Like, I was like, that's so much fun. It was, yeah, it was great. It was weird. People are literally still commenting months later, Taylor liked in the TikTok. And I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> so she was super active early in the Eras tour. She liked my video like the second day of the Eras tour back in March. And she was like going crazy every night. I think she wanted to know what people thought of the tour. And so she was going through and liking like that. So people were really obsessed with like, what is she gravitating towards content wise? Because it gave us a lot of hints towards surprise songs. I feel like it's very smart of her to have those likes on because it's her way of communicating with us without even communicating. Like it's so genius. But I feel like you were one of like probably one of the last few videos that she's actually liked because she kind of has gone dark on social media. And this is a bit of a hard pivot, but I was seeing before this and I posted on the broadcast channel, if you guys are in there with the whole, have you heard about this like Universal Music Group situation or Sony Music where tons of artists music, I'm sure Beyonce will be affected. Is Beyonce on TikTok? Uh, Beyonce is on TikTok. Taylor's definitely a bigger on TikTok. It's yeah. like Beyonce's Instagram, Taylor is TikTok. Yes, yes, I think I totally agree with that. 
but I know that a lot of their music, I'm curious to see by the time this is out, we'll have an answer on it, but a lot of their music's getting pulled from there. But anyways, I think it's interesting when artists use features on platforms like that. Now, you know, I want to go backwards and learn a little bit more about you before we talk specifically about pop culture, because I think the biggest difference in what I'm excited to talk to you about is I am like a huge Swifty, but I don't know much about like other celebrities, other fan bases, pop culture in general. Like I know the headlines. I know what's going on. Like if something's happening with the royal family or like whatever, I will indulge in the moment, but I definitely am not like a pop culture enthusiast. I'm curious to know you recently moved to LA, right? I did. I did. Just, well, two years ago now. It's actually... Oh my God, it's like today is my two year anniversary. <laughs> oh my gosh, so fun. I feel like that's actually a big hump to make in LA because cities like LA, New York, it's a very transient place. Like people come for six months, come for a year, dip their toe in the water, and then actually dip and leave. Do you feel like you could see yourself staying here now that you've crossed two years? I don't ever want to leave. I want to stay here forever. So I will say the one thing about living in LA that I love, and I'll never, I'll never leave LA now. Like I'm pretty much obsessed with being here because it feels like everyone here has a lot of similar interests, which I'm not used to growing up in a small mm -hmm. town and going to dinner parties, Halloween parties, you can bounce off of people way easier. So even when I'm talking about this Swifty journey or my obsession with Taylor Swift, no one here is thrown off by that. They're like, oh my God, that's no. amazing. Tell me more. Uh, versus if I was back home, people would be like, dude, shut up. <laughs> Yes, I feel that. I lived in Florida before moving. I grew up in California for a bit. And then I lived in Florida for like 10, 11 years and moved back. And I feel like spending the majority of my time like high school, college in Florida, I was seen as like a crazy lady. Like people thought I was nuts, even wearing like cowboy boots in Florida, like for fun and not because I'm like from the country. People were like, are you good like what's going on here so I totally relate to you that here I feel like the acceptance people just work in the industry too so I feel like other people are obsessed with it now I'm curious was being interested in this sort of like pop culture world because you work in HR so were you driven to move to LA because of the pop culture scene or was that just coincidence it was definitely because of the pop culture scene I wanted to be closer to entertainment I wanted to meet more people who like the things that I look I was also, I'm still actively trying to find love. I'm trying to find a man. So Taylor Ooh, Swift. Do we have any listeners? <laughs> do we have any listeners? But so I definitely have found Taylor Swift at the right time while I'm going through this, this romance segment of my life. So I'm definitely enjoying that. But LA is just the perfect place for, for pop culture commentary. I love that. You're in your soon to be lover era. Hopefully we're manifesting the lover era for you. We're manifesting the lover era, which is crazy because False God was the song that like threw me even deeper into it. After I heard Slut, everyone in my comments was like, go and listen to False God right now. Go and oh. listen to False God right now. And that was like that. I couldn't stop at that point. See, that's so interesting. So I have your favorite songs written down. So False God, Dress. My Tears Ricochet and Invisible String. Like, I feel like those four songs alone tell such a story of Taylor's life, but also give me so much insight into, like, your Taylor taste, if you will. Because people who like those songs, definitely a different vibe from, like, me, Shake It Off, you know, 22, like, very different vibes. So are you, would you consider yourself, like, a folklore I've definitely moved deep into folklore. I love okay. it. I love the poem sessions. I could not stop watching. I watched the poem sessions three times. I was so obsessed yes. with it. I wish I wish that there was something like that for Evermore as well. I don't think there is, is there? No. Evermore was interesting because I feel like the, a lot of people say like Evermore was the gypped album because it felt like Yes, it was so fun to get them back to back, whatever it was, like a few months apart. But then Evermore just kind of got swept under the rug because it was like whiplash. So much was happening in the Taylor verse, if you will. So Evermore, I feel like, yeah, she even has not acknowledged Evermore much. But ironically, on opening night of the Eras tour, both me and Kayla were there. She literally said, I've seen your TikToks. I don't not like Evermore. I don't know where you guys got this idea. So let's play some Evermore music. And that's like how she led into it or something. But it's interesting. Yeah, a lot of people feel like Evermore got slept on. And what I find so often, and Kayla and I had talked about this, was I feel like depending on your age, 
certain albums speak to you more. And I don't know if that's because it like resonates with the stage of life that we're in. But I feel like the three albums I hear our generation like the most is Folklore, Evermore, and Midnight's. And it's interesting. I don't know if that's just because those are like Taylor's most mature or vulnerable albums, even though Folklore is a lot of storytelling. And, and to your point about our, our age groups and really liking Folklore, for me, it's the storytelling. So I'm obsessed with movies and like, Folklore does something to me where like, it's almost like I'm visualizing the story that she's telling for folklore in my head. It's very rare that I've had an artist be able to paint a story in my brain just through listening to the album. Like I didn't, yeah. I didn't really need any sort of visual album or anything to understand the story that she was painting at folklore. And that is what really has me obsessed with folklore. Like if, if there was a movie that was created just about folklore alone, I think it would be at the Oscars, no questions asked. I've always thought folklore would be an interesting transition if she ever did want to explore writing and doing a book. I feel like she could absolutely do even a whole book series expanding upon just the folklore stories itself. And one of my top five favorite Taylor songs of all time is Last Great American Dynasty. And that's like not a very heavily talked about song. So I was absolutely shook when she played it at the Eras Tour because I thought for sure that one would get cut. But I just love my favorite. And this is actually something that relates to one of the Swifty submissions at the end that we'll talk about. But my favorite is that lyric switch. It's so simple. But when she's like, and then it was bought by me. I remember the first time I listened to that and I was like, oh, she bought the house like it was so cool how it felt like the story was actually taking place like a really long time ago but then she was talking about the current time at the same time and I feel like that is really difficult to translate in so few lyrics and in like two minutes so I agree with you I think the storytelling is really hard hitting in folklore and is why it draws our demographic in so heavily I'm curious to know you mentioned Beyonce what other artists are you into are they vastly different from this? Like, are you into smaller artists, a lot of big artists? Who do you listen to outside of Taylor Beyonce? I say I listen to a lot of pop. So that's probably another reason why the sound of Slut and False God really hooked me in. Because I like a lot of Ariana Grande. I like Mariah Carey carried me through the pandemic. Mm. That was my pandemic artist all the way through. I like Britney Spears a lot. Mm. Janet Jackson. Um, very much pop through and through so okay. when i'm thinking about the earlier country albums that people really like in the grassroots of taylor's career were obsessed with i feel like since i'm from this small town i was like really trying to get away from country growing up so okay. i didn't really listen to country because i was like it's everywhere around me you know there's a big country concert that happens at like the allen county fair i was like i'm trying to listen to pop music and at the time like you know, being gay in a small town listening to pop music was like my true push. And that was like, yes, that was like an obsession with Beyonce. And that's like really what drove me. So then this Lover album and 1989 and Slut and all of those songs, I'm like, wow, she's like taking me back to music that I wish I had when I was in high school. So like, oh, I, and I, I, wasn't, I wasn't listening to her then and I, I should have been. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny, like back then, it was interesting because I was listening to this stuff, but it was so hush-hush because people made fun of you for being a Taylor Swift fan. And I don't know why that is. And it's just so funny seeing the stark contrast now. But it wasn't as, we also didn't have, you know, Instagram was what, 2012 when it came about. So it wasn't like we were consuming other people's opinions as much. So I feel like it was just easier to keep it to yourself, especially with like buying songs on iTunes. Like if I didn't have a gift card, I wasn't buying the songs or if I didn't have enough money, I was just going to buy a couple songs from the album that I heard on the radio and not the whole thing. So I feel like now, thanks to streaming, it's a lot easier for us to just like dive deep into these artists. I'm curious from like your pop culture perspective, we talked in the beginning about how everybody like jumped in your comments and came to your aid, if you will, like in the beginning of your Swifty journey. I'm assuming now, have you listened to all the albums? The one album I have left is Red. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That's an yeah. interesting one. Red to me has some standouts, but I actually feel like a lot of them for me personally are skips. But I'm curious to know, maybe we'll have to do like a revisit episode once you dove into Red and we could like do a whole thing on Red and see what your thoughts are because I would be curious to know. That one's definitely, I feel like people are going to have thoughts on that because a lot of people live, laugh, love for Red. But for me personally, it's not on the top of my list. Okay, so speaking of Beyonce, I would love to kind of talk about your experience as a fan being in the beehive, is it Bayhive or Beehive? 
Beehive, yeah. Beehive, okay. Being a Beyonce Ooh. fan for so long, being a part of that, I like Beyonce a lot. I've actually seen her in person here in LA. She was a celebrity sighting for me. Very fun and exciting. But I've never been to a concert of hers, so I feel like I'm definitely not a part of her fandom, if you will. What do you think, aside from just the sheer like attention Taylor's fan base is getting right now, what have you noticed in terms of like how Beyonce engages with her fans and how Taylor engages with her fans? What are some of the differences you've noticed? Well, I will say the one thing about the fan bases and kind of like getting made fun of, the Hive has experienced that too. The Hive okay. experienced it. I think, I think the difference that people can't really remember about Beyonce's career and Taylor's career right now is when Beyonce was in her 30s, she was doing this extreme overexposure, cementing yourself into yes. the music industry, which Taylor is doing right now. It's the strongest thing that someone with this much talent and this much visibility can do at this time in their career. And Beyonce fans were definitely getting made fun of a lot too. I would say the biggest difference from the fan bases is Beyonce's strategy has always been like, no one can really touch Beyonce. You know, Beyonce is like up on a shelf. She's like mm -hmm. almost like this person that you want to get close to, but like you're never really going to get it. And that's a yeah. lot of the reason why you hear Beyonce is the celebrity amongst celebrities because celebrities feel the same way about Beyonce that her fans do. Like they can't really even get close to her. Versus Taylor's strategy, as I've been diving in deeper as a fan, People were like, oh, did you know that Taylor used to hold listening events at her house? I was like, what? That's yeah. something we would never experience in the hive at all. You know, that's you, you never really get that close. So it makes me understand why Taylor's fan base really is so close to her. They hold her so dear to their heart. The strategies are totally different. They're both obsessive. We're all mm -hmm. obsessive about these two oh, yeah. people. But it's so interesting how they both have grown these fan bases to really continue to grow with them because that's all that matters. At the end of the day, who Beyonce was in her 30s and who she is in her 40s, she now no longer has to write any sort of commercial music at all. So mm -hmm. watching Taylor go through the Airs tour and do this thing of like re-giving her fans all the music, I'm so excited to see what kind of artists Taylor becomes in her 40s when the only people she's writing music for is her core fan base. And that's what we're seeing with Beyonce right now. That's what we're seeing with the Renaissance tour. She doesn't care if it's commercially selling. She's only doing it for the people who have been writing with her from the beginning. And I can see that's where Taylor is going next. I can see the excitement behind her next album. While I actually hope Reputation, Taylor's version is next and not a new album, but I'm yeah. excited to see like, what that next album is going to be like, because I have a feeling it's going to be something that solely only speaks to the people who've been writing with her for day, from day one. I think you hit the nail on the head. I feel like this was such a strategic decision for her, especially coming off the tail of Lover Fest not happening because it got canceled because of COVID. I think that was going to be a cultural movement in itself. Doing a festival instead of a stadium tour was a really interesting choice. Nixing that, dropping Folklore Evermore, and then pivoting into this like, here's my entire discography. Let's wrap a bow around it, blow it up as much as possible. Like, you can't tell me she didn't think this was going to be explosive. Like, I just, I know the strategy behind this, exactly what you said. Let's remind people who I am. Let's get new people in. Like, now it's all the people who are in their 30s who have kids. Let's get them all into it. Like, it, she really grabbed the attention of so many more people, she, even older, you know, people who are like my mom's age who are like, well, I guess I'll give this a lesson. And there's so much talk about it. But I'm curious. I feel like there's going to be more criticism than ever, regardless of if she writes TS11 for the fans or not, which I do. I'm fully convinced it's already done. I just feel like it's a matter of the timing will be everything. I'm curious to see what it'll be like if we'll see her do what she's been doing, drop an album, go on tour, repeat this pattern. I, for one, think she might go dark and say, like, here's my gift to you. And, you know, I'm going to go live life for a bit and enjoy it. I'm very curious to see because that decision that she makes will kind of show what her plan is kind of through the rest of her 30s. I hate to put like age on it, but I do think she's been very honest about the fact, look at Beyonce's, you know, trajectory of age wise, like she's going to want to have a family. She's going to want to have kids. Taylor's been very honest about that. 
But I, I do wonder if she regrets now having the last two re-records kind of dictating that pivot or transition into TS-11. I feel like having debut and having reputation looming over her, it's kind of holding her back from re-enter or entering, I guess, a new era. So I have a theory that we're going to kind of ride out the year of 2024 with the rest of the era's tour. We'll get reputation, get debut. And then I think she will immediately transition into let's move on. I'm still a great artist. My eras were great, but I can still make new music. What do you think would be a good strategy wise for her? What do you think TS11 will look like, I guess? I think she'll, well, I will say this. If I was on her team, I would actually just, after the re-records, take a break and live life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think it's the smartest thing you can do. I think one thing that you saw in like the height of Beyonce's career is like her thing has always been performance. Her push has always been performance. And the Ares tour is the most performing I've ever seen out of Taylor. I could be totally wrong as a new fan. No, you're very I've right. Never, I've never seen this many shows from her. And I can remember at one point in Beyonce's tour, I think it's like the Mrs. Carter World Tour. She did like over 120 shows. Like it was just nonstop push, push, push. But it almost cemented her so hard into her fan base that her next few tours, like she really didn't have to try that hard at all. She didn't have to do as much as she needed to do, even though she still gives us a lot. Right. Same thing with Taylor. I think right now what I'm seeing with Taylor is an even more elevated approach to that where the draw of the fan base is so strong right now that if she were to take a break because at the end of the day she is human like her body does need to rest if yeah. she were to take like anywhere from like a three to four year break or really just even like a, a three year break to work on family work on herself the way this tour has gone and the way this music has just pumped back into mainstream media and any sort of charting like seeing old songs chart again i feel like she's locked in like she's locked yeah. in with her fan base she new fans in this is everything you need to do to be able to take some time away i completely agree i think she's even i mean beyond just the cultural movement there's been a lot of interesting i mean legislation with ticketmaster i think we could see in that time off from her a lot of advocacy I was speaking with my boyfriend, Matt, about Morgan Wallen recently made a post on his Instagram. I guess he had signed a really bad deal like 10 years ago, way before he blew up. And the old label or whoever he signed this deal with was releasing old music of his that was unreleased. And he basically decided to re-record it and say, well, if this is going to be put out, I would rather it be under me versus these old people. So please stream my new re-recorded version or something along those lines. It was on Instagram recently. And I was like, you know what? I feel like without Taylor doing this, that really was never done before. People would laugh at that. And I think Taylor credits Kelly Clarkson all the time because Kelly Clarkson was the reason she re-recorded everything. Mm -hmm. Kelly Clarkson kept pushing her and saying, just re-record it. Like, it's not that crazy. And so I think it's interesting. I think we'll see a lot come from future tours from artists, future strategy-wise. I think, yeah, I think she'll really bask in sort of the movement that this this tour really was. The advocacy, taking some time off and getting more involved with politics. I, I did watch Miss Americana mm -hmm. and I saw like a bit of like that experience there. But the Ticketmaster mention is really big. I would love to see big artists, her, Beyonce, Ariana, Adele. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe for uh, Rihanna is going to want to yeah. get the Ticketmaster and be together before her next album. I, I'm still one of those believers that we are getting one more Rihanna album. If all of those people came together and really advocated against Ticketmaster, not just for them and the money that they're getting, but at this point, Ticketmaster is scamming us and the artist. Right. So... If they fight for us and they fight for the prices for us, I think we're way more likely to buy even more tickets to their shows because it's getting ridiculous. And I just saw on the news the other day, since we are in election year, so we're mm -hmm. watching the news. One of the biggest plans for Joe Biden is to try to get Taylor Swift to endorse him. That's been the biggest talk that I've been I seeing. I have not heard this. Oh, there's this, there's all this, there's all this conversation about how the Joe Biden team has like this 10 page document of ways that they're trying to convince Taylor Swift and other large celebrities to be with them, but specifically Taylor Swift. And I hope 
Ticketmaster is a part of that conversation because from a tax perspective, from just like people trying to enjoy their lives, we've been fighting to get outside ever since the pandemic and Ticketmaster is ruining our lives. Yes. And draining our wallets. Draining our wallets. So hopefully that's a part of the conversation because I'm sure there's some laws being broken there. Oh, absolutely. I think she, I mean, speaking of election, I saw something that said every year there's like, you know how you can write in someone for president, even if they're not running every year, like a lot of people write in, you know, like people wrote in Kanye West or whatever. They said like they are predicting that she could actually win, like just based off the amount of people who will probably jokingly write Taylor Swift on the ballot. Like that's an actual concern of theirs because of how big she's gotten. Not that she would ever run for president, but uh, that would be a, a plot twist of all plot twists. But I do think it's interesting. The numbers that she pulls, she typically posts like on her Instagram stories every time there's some sort of local election. She usually will advocate for somebody in Nashville or whatever's happening in Tennessee if there's a Tennessee election going on. But when the actual presidential election comes around with one Instagram story, more voters around the age of 18 register than any other time of the year. It's so, so fascinating, mm. the poll that she has. And I know she has a lot of passions when it comes to stuff like that. So yeah, I, I am curious, like post, you know, a peak time in her career, what really comes out of her in terms of other creative pursuits. And we, we know she's into directing. That's something she's been very open about. And I don't know. I'm just curious to see kind of how that shift or what that shift looks like. And I think that'll honestly, arguably for fans, be an even more exciting time to see what else creatively she can kind of push out in in her future later career. Do you feel like I, I'm so curious? Obviously, we know Taylor is open about the fact Beyonce is a big inspiration to her, you know, with Beyonce going to the premiere and her going to hers. I thought that that was like a healing moment for society. <laughs> With both of them supporting each other. I'm so curious behind the scenes. Like, I have no idea timeline wise, like when they would have connected beyond obviously the whole Kanye incident. And I'm assuming maybe that's when they formed some sort of friendship. Or, but I'm so curious. We've never seen that play out publicly at all, aside from recently and with them supporting each other. Do you know anything about that? I think that their two publicists can accomplish anything. Everybody talks about Tree in the Hive. We talk about Yvette like nonstop. So the idea of people trying to understand of like, you know, when they met, you know, when they had dinner, I know they talked. I mm -hmm. Their publicists can get anything done. Like those two women are unstoppable. And together, I can't even imagine. They probably already have an entire music video secretly shot that none of us even know about. Oh, yeah. Uh, I wouldn't even be surprised. I am convinced that the reason that they've been together so much is because that there is something recorded. I am wholeheartedly one of those people who truly believe that the project that they both have next is there's going to be some sort of sister song situation coming from either camps. We've kind of seen Beyonce perfect this with the rollout of video phone and telephone with Lady Gaga. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm really believing that Taylor and Beyonce are going to have a sister song. And one thing about Beyonce is her real thing that makes her special is that she wants to master every genre. So that's why mm -hmm. you see Beyonce R&B, you see her trying rock, you see her trying rap, you see her on the Country Music Awards with the chicks singing mm -hmm. country music. I think Beyonce wants a hit country song. And I think with Reputation being the next album, the next re-record that we see, hopefully. Yes. I feel that's so confident. We, as a we all protect. feel it in our soul. <laughs> I would I would love to see, I would love to see either a Taylor's version song with Beyonce on Reputation and then a, a Taylor song on Act Two for Renaissance, like a dual song together that brought both albums up. That I think that would be perfect for both of their next projects. And if it's not on Reputation, if she were to release Reputation, considering what that album is all about, and then have a song with Beyonce come out immediately after, I can't even think of a word more than iconic at that point. Earth shattering. Smart, earth shattering. For the both of them, that's a win-win. Like that is, that is a win-win at this point. 
I we need think it. We deserve this is my new favorite theory. I'm fully riding this wave. I've jumped on faster than I ever have before on a clown theory. I do think strategically there's no loses in either of those. And from a PR perspective, speaking of Tree and Yvette, I think it would squash the, because a lot of 2023, although it was the year of the girls, I think there was still a ton of media loved pinning Taylor and Beyonce against each other. Whose tour is going to perform better? Whose ticket prices are more? And it was like nobody in the, the fandoms were actually beefing. Like it was just the media making up this whole story and neither Taylor or Beyonce were beefing. I feel like that was also purposeful with both of them intentionally attending each other's premieres to be like, we're here to support. We're not doing this. I think at one point Taylor was like, I'm purposefully taking mine out of theaters to make sure hers has enough time to like, you know, whatever it is. So I do think from PR perspective, absolutely genius. An incredible pivot to speaking to Taylor, moving into that maturity aspect, joining with Beyonce, who's someone so established and arguably one of the only women that are like, they're both on their own levels. I think that those are the only two people that could really come together and be on this each other's levels and understand that. So I love that. I want to leave everyone with that theory. Let us know if you think that that would be in any realm of a possibility. (laughs) And I think this is a perfect transition to our Swifty submissions because people had some thoughts in terms of eras, in terms of thoughts of what's coming next. This was Brielle. And Brielle said she thinks that Taylor and Travis are getting married. It's a matter of when. This is her 13th boyfriend. A lot of people have this thought. Obviously, say what you want about Travis. This is the most public we've ever seen Taylor with the relationship. Also interesting from a PR perspective, seeing her be public and even PDA wise. I think this is an interesting shift of like, I'm no longer a little girl. But anyways, Brielle said, I think Travis and Taylor are getting married. Travis is Taylor's 13th boyfriend. If that says anything, we know 13 is her lucky number. I'm just saying it's meant to be. What do you guys think? What do you think about this whole Travis situation and being so public as of recent? I wholeheartedly think this is the one. I wholeheartedly believe that this is her match. After my entrance into the fandom of Slut being the song that brought me in, and then at that point, I'm like, okay, well, what was going on with her that she wrote a song like Slut? Listening to her experience, and this is what my, I think this is like my third biggest Taylor Swift TikTok was about this topic, Mm. is after starting to go through the albums, and hearing the subject matter that she's talking about, she definitely cannot date another actor. They can't no. handle the type of fame that a pop star has, it feels like. She can't date another musician because they're just going to compare themselves to her consistently. She really needs to try to almost stay away from that entertainment realm of a partner, you know? Taylor and Travis both being at the top of their fields in two completely different industries is perfect. The football player and the American princess who understand the media and the way the media talks about them and their relationships. People kept saying, well, Taylor doesn't really seem like like Travis's type, but people aren't understanding that Travis's relationships have been also incredibly picked apart by the media consistently. Yeah. Everything that he's done with his, his girlfriends. So I'm sure they both understand how they have to respect each other while also dealing with the media, that other people aren't just gonna, they're not just gonna vibe with her at that speed. I think this is the one. I think this is the perfect match for her. And hopefully when she takes that break, it's marriage and a couple kids with Travis. (laughs) I completely agree with you. I think what I noticed in him compared to other people she's dated, and it's hard to compare, you know, I would say, okay, maybe Harry Styles is more confident now than he was when he was dating Taylor, whatever it is. That was obviously like 10, 12 years ago. But I think he is so confident that it just completely negates like any sort of insecurities. I feel like that we saw so much insecurity from Joe. Obviously, career-wise, I think there was a lot of competition there. But I think just in general, the fact that he was so insecure being so public with the relationship and publicly supporting her, I think that that alone, her having someone who doesn't make her feel so isolated and comparing the first time she attended a Chiefs game until the last time, I made a world of a difference. The fact that she's like on the field kissing him like they're publicly saying I love you I mean it's just been so exciting to see so I completely agree with you Brielle thank you for sending in that question yeah I want to say one more thing I feel that something that she really hasn't had is an equivalent obsession with greatness and that's Mm. what has been missing there is this element about Travis where he wants to win 
And something that I've noticed about Taylor, she really vocalizes winning. You know, she really vocalizes what she wants. And he clearly knows what he wants as well. They want to be the best in their respective fields. And I don't think she's had anyone that can really match her in that level of work ethic. And the type of longevity that she's pushing for in her career, that's not something that really anybody can even say in like a corporate field, let alone a pop star or an athlete. They're both pushing to be the best at a level that is not really something that they're going to find in other people. I couldn't agree more. I think it's fascinating as well. I would love for a psychologist to break down. There's actually so many parallels between the career that they have. They both don't have finite endings to them. Like, you know, obviously injury could be something for both of them that would end a career. But to your point, it's very fascinating to see even his family dynamic being so easy for her to integrate into. Yeah, I'm just I'm I'm very curious to see the trajectory that this goes on. And it's so unique in that we can publicly enjoy both of their careers. We can publicly tune into his career every weekend or every weekday, whatever time his game's on. We can virtually join into the Eurus tour. We can see what she's up to every day on social media. I think what I would love from both of them, and I was just telling someone last night, we need like a Victoria, David Beckham, Taylor Travis crossover. We need a dinner party moment, an interview with the four of them. Like we need them to become, because that is genuinely the only couple on planet Earth that can relate exactly to this scenario. I had someone in one of my TikTok comments, they said, Victoria Beckham wasn't that big. And I said, get out of here. Because because if the Spice Girls were to have continued, like what they were able to do in just like an eight year time frame is like insane. Like I, I could not believe that someone was actually in my comments saying that Victoria, Victoria Beckham wasn't that, wasn't that posh Spice. Are you kidding me? Be for real. They're probably 11 years old if they're saying that. I was like, okay, like, (laughs) come on. This is unbelievable. But yeah. And then another thing about Victoria Beckham that I see Taylor does really well with the way in which she communicates with her fans. Like, I could see Taylor not making music for a good three, five years and still keeping her fans entertained in ways outside of music, like yep. pushing out other projects. Victoria Beckham's push into fashion is something that I don't think people are really noticing what makes her the type of celebrity that she is, longevity in your career. And I think Taylor is definitely going to have that. Like there's other things that I know she wants and that's why she's going to need that break at some point to really get those other things going as well. I completely agree. I have to introduce our guest because she's very much wanting to be a part of the episode. <laughs> she's been on my lap, like purring, and I'm like, all right, I gotta bring her up. She's just when dying. She's, so cute. <laughs> she's so cute. This is Tortellini. She loves her camera time. She's never made an appearance, actually. Hello. We're almost done, ma'am. She's like, where's my dinner? Hello. <laughs> What a ham. I agree with you. The sophistication level that we see from Victoria Beckham is something that I agree. There's a lot of parallels between Taylor. And I just think the the sheer dynamic of the two. Did you watch the Beckham Netflix documentary? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I did. It was so good. Fascinating to see how these are two very different humans, like emotionally, like how they approach life, very different but arguably extremely similar to Taylor and Travis, like extreme similarities, but also extreme differences. So if you have not seen that, I absolutely encourage you to go watch. But this was so fun. I loved swift pivoting and clowning with you. I know. I know. I can do this all day. I love this. (laughs) Well, make sure if you guys are listening, send me an email, swiftyschoolpod at Gmail. Let me know if you liked this episode. Drop it in the comments. Leave a note for us on Spotify. Whatever you want to do, I would love your feedback because if you want K-Tone back, obviously we have so much pop culture to talk about. And I feel like just Taylor's career, I want to get more into beyond sort of the obvious things that are happening in her career, like the Eras Tour and all that. I want to talk about more you know, the marketing side of her, the behind the scenes side, you know, so if that's something you guys be interested in us talking about further, definitely let me know. But before we close out the episode, I want to call out our newest members, 
of the class of 2024 of the Swifty School Patreon. So we've got four new faces to welcome, which is Mel, Cassie, Melissa, and Stacy. Thank you guys so much for joining. And more importantly, K-Tone, thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hopefully I get to come back. I would love, I would love to talk Taylor some more. Oh my gosh. Of course. Well, we will have to do a catch up after you listen to Red. But for now, if you guys are interested in finding K-Tone on social media, absolutely iconic that your name is your TikTok handle. It's just K-Tone. There's only a few people that have it. I feel like I've done it. Maybe this is the push I needed. (laughs) Yes. So you can find him at K-Tone, K-A-T-O-N-E on TikTok or K-Tone Roberts over on Instagram. You can head to the description either on Instagram or here wherever you're listening for those direct links to anything that we talked about. And of course, his viral TikTok, which Taylor liked. Definitely check out my Swiftification journey. The playlist is the first playlist on my TikTok account. Watch it. I think you'll like it. Swiftification. We're going to have to add that to the Swifty dictionary. I have not used that one yet. Anyways, it's another great day to be alive at the same time as Taylor Swift. Thank you guys so much for joining, and I will see you on the next one. Bye, K-Town. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. I know all too well how busy life can be, and I am so grateful that you chose to stay, stay, stay. Now just know this is me trying, and I would greatly appreciate if you took a minute to leave a review or maybe share this episode with a fellow Swifty. Make sure you join my broadcast channel on Instagram for more Swiftivities. And long story short, this love is real, and I'm beyond grateful for your support. See you next time.